April 1992, in a suburb of Tel Aviv, a Jewish man found that his apartment was on fire. And in the next half hour, not only would his apartment go up in flames, but his two neighbors' apartments would also be totally destroyed by fire. He knew the fire was happening. He knew his neighbors' apartments were burning down, and yet apparently did nothing to call the fire department because by the time they found out, the damage had already been done. So what was he doing during that half hour? Why not just go and call the fire department? Well, the truth of the matter was is he was with his rabbi seeking counsel on whether it would be right to call the fire department on the Sabbath. And because he and the rabbi couldn't come to a decision whether it was legal to call the fire department on the Sabbath, his apartment burned down and his two neighbors' apartments burned down. We may shake our heads. We may wonder how anyone could ever do that kind of an extreme thing in the name of quote-unquote religion. But the one thing we can't deny was that evidently in this man's heart there was a very earnest and real desire to do what was right. And after all, is it wrong to do right? It's not, is it? And if we were listening to our scripture reading today, it tells us that we are to be holy, righteous, because who is holy and righteous? Because God is. And if we take it a step further, we realize that God, because of our failures and because of sin in our lives, he hasn't lowered the bar or the standard of righteousness, has he? It is the same as it always has been. The standard for righteousness and salvation has always been and still is today the perfect righteousness of God himself. Be holy because I am holy. God didn't lower the bar, make excuses, make it easier for us, quote unquote, because we had failed. And it becomes easy to see why through all of history there have always been those who have worked very, very hard, even to extreme measures, trying to be what? Good. And in Jesus' day, he dealt with one very such group all the time, it seemed. But had we been present with Jesus when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he brings up this group of people and we would have probably been surprised at what he said. And so in your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, where we find Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, chapter 5, and we want to look at verses 17 through 20. If you happen to be following along in the Pew Bible there in front of you, that is page 959. Matthew chapter 5, and we want to look at verses 17 through 20. And it says there, Jesus speaking, of course, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is established. In other words, again, has God done anything to lower the bar because of sin? Nothing has changed, he says. Verse 19, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, and then listen to what Jesus says next. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses what? That of the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of what? Of heaven. 
Now, if you were with us last Sabbath, the parable that we talked about, and we continue on today, by the way, in our summer series on the parables of Jesus, but last week we talked about the parable of the landowner, and remember that he hired some for 12 hours, and ultimately he comes down to that one that he hired right at the very last hour, and their pay was all what? All the same. And that parable was all about grace. The grace of God. And there is nothing that we can do to earn the kingdom of heaven. It is all the grace of Jesus Christ. But then we come to Jesus' words here. That in order to inherit the kingdom of God, now he says, we must be right more righteous than who? The Pharisees. There is something that doesn't quite line up, isn't there? It seems like Jesus in one breath is saying, it's all about grace, it's all about the gift of eternal life that I want to give you. And then on the other side here, he's saying, no, to be saved, to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you must be more righteous than even the Pharisees. Something's out of alignment here. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been dealing with alignment in my pickup truck. I couldn't get it aligned because there were things that were wrong with the front end. And so I've been working to put a new ball joint in and tie rods and so forth. Uh, probably a little bit above what I should have been doing, but we got through it. But I learned that when your vehicle is in alignment, you should be able to take your steering wheel and turn it so your front wheel is straight. And then as you look down a line, it should be perfectly straight with the back tire. And when all four tires do that, you are in alignment. Well, when I got done doing the repairs on the front, and this is the way it always will be, by the way. This wasn't anything I did wrong, right? Um, but when it was done, I was out at Vaughn's just having him double-check the things that I had done. And, and so he said, well, let's take a look at where it is here and how much they're going to have to put it into alignment. So we lined up the driver's side front tire and the back tire perfectly straight, steering wheel where it was supposed to, and then we walked over to the other side to see if those were lined up, and lo and behold, this front tire on the passenger side was shooting almost out at a 20 degree angle. My truck was not in alignment, and I found out how much so when I drove back home and was going through the roundabouts that are out in front of the airport right now. It was like I was trying real hard to go this way, and part of my truck wanted to go with me, it seemed like, but the other part didn't want to do that at all. It wanted to go straight, and I was not going very fast, but it sounded like I was playing Dukes of Hazard back in the whatever time because my wheels were literally making this loud squealing noise on the pavement because one tire was trying to what? turn and the other was wanting to go off in the other direction somewhere. It was out of alignment and that's where we appear to be with Jesus here. It doesn't feel quite right for him to say it's all about grace, it's this gift I'm going to give you and yet at the same time over here we're feeling like we're being pulled in the opposite direction because he's saying you have to be more righteous than who? The Pharisees. So how are we going to bring Jesus' words into alignment here? Well, we're going to go to the parable that we're studying today, which is found in the Gospel of Luke. And if you would turn there with me, Luke chapter 18. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so just a couple of books away, page 1037 or 38 in your pew Bible there. Luke chapter 18, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 14. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector here, Luke chapter 18 and verses 9 through 14. And it says there, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, he said, I thank you that I am not like other men. You know, the robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. 
he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, speaking of the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be what? Exalted. So a couple things to look at right away with this parable. First, as we look at verse 9, who was Jesus' intended audience as he told this parable? What does it tell us there? It says he was speaking to those who were confident of their own what? Righteousness. And those who looked down on who? Now, this is important to keep in mind here. It says they looked down on everybody else. Now, we want to tie that back to what Jesus said in Matthew. If we're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, our righteousness must be greater than that of the Pharisees. And here we have a Pharisee who's praying, and it says Jesus, as he's talking about the audience here, they look down, not on some people, but on who? Everybody else. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind when I read those words about who Jesus was speaking to is I just thank God I'm not like them. Have you ever felt that way with those words before? You know, I actually semi-thought that as I began studying this week. Wow, I'm glad I don't seem to be like that. And then you read the rest of the parable, and pretty soon you find out, you know who that sounds like? The guy who was praying, I'm glad I'm not like the rest of them. And the reality is, have any of you before in your life ever tried to rely on self-righteousness before? Have you ever looked at someone else and looked at them in a way that made them lesser than you? If we're honest, when we read verse 9, Jesus is speaking to who? To all of us here today. Because we have all been like the Pharisee at a time or two in our lives. So that's the audience and we get to be a part of it. Jesus is speaking to us today. And then we go down to verse 14 because this is the whole point of the parable Jesus is telling. He says here, I tell you that this man, referring to the tax collector, is the only one who went home that day, what? Justified. So the key point of Jesus' parable here is justification. Jesus is showing us what it looks like to be one who is justified. Or, as the definition of justified tells us, and it's important for us to understand this, those declared to be right before God, or declared righteous. I want to read you from Albert Barnes's commentary here on justification. It says, justification is the declared purpose of God to regard and treat those sinners who believe in Jesus Christ as if they had not what? Not sinned on the ground of the merits of the Savior. It has reference to those sins as forgiven and blotted out. Justification has respect to the law. It is an act by which God determines to treat him hereafter as righteous and as if he had not sinned. Now, does that sound like a good place to be? To have God look at us today as if we had never what? as if we had never, ever sinned. That sounds like a very good place to be. And that's what it is to be justified. And Jesus says in this parable, it is the tax collector who got to go home justified. So we see here in this parable a couple of things. First, there are some similarities in these men. They both come to the same place to do what? To pray or to worship. And once they're there, they both do what? They both offer up a prayer. And where do they both come, by the way? It is to the what? It's to the temple. To be in whose presence? 
to God's presence. And so as we read this, both of these men have come into the very presence of God and they have come to worship, they have come to pray. And as we understand what it means as we come to worship and pray at the temple, biblically they both came bringing an offering to present before God. That is what their prayer is. It is an offering. Did you know that when you pray, you are presenting an offering before God? You are laying it before his feet. And that is what both of these men did. And it paints a picture here of two worshipers, one that ultimately is accepted or justified and one who is not. And that is something that has been a part of God's people from its very inception. Keep your finger here in, in Luke chapter 18. Turn back to the very first book of the Bible here, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 5. Genesis chapter 4, and in your Bible, that's page 4. Following along there, Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 2 through 5, and we'll actually just pick up verse 2 here about in the middle. It says, Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Verse 5, it says, But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Here we have, again, two brothers who have come to do what? They have come to worship God. They have come to the same altar and they have both brought a what? An offering. One of them was accepted and the other was rejected. Sound familiar? Jesus' parable is hitting on the very same theme. That is something that has been present from the beginning of time and it is present here today. Matthew Henry's commentary says, Among the worshipers of God in the visible church, which is us today, there is a mixture of some who are accepted of God and some that are not. And so it has been ever since Cain and Abel brought their offering to the same altar. Christ's object lesson says the Pharisees and the publicans represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. The first two representatives are found in the first two children that were born into the world. Cain thought himself righteous, and he came to God with a thank offering. Now tuck that away. He came to God with what? A thank offering because he was confident in, confident in his own what? Righteousness. Goes on to say here that he made no confession of sin and acknowledged no need of mercy. Abel, on the other hand, came with the blood that pointed to the Lamb of God. He came as a sinner, confessing himself lost. His only hope was in the unmerited love of God. And so we see a contrast. And we want to take the story of Cain and Abel now and apply it back to our parable today to help us understand more clearly what's happening here. So back to Luke chapter 18. And we will look at the Pharisee here again. And again, he is being compared to, in the story of Cain and Abel, he is compared to Cain, who brought a thank offering to God because he was confident in his own what? His own righteousness. Now let's read again the words about the Pharisee and see if that lines up, which is 18, chapter 18 in Luke here, verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood up and prayed, and this is interesting. My Bible says he prayed about himself. You ever prayed about yourself before? I would venture that probably somewhere along the line we all have done the same. But the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I what? God, I thank you. What kind of an offering is he bringing? He's bringing a thank offering just as Cain did. Why is he bringing a thank offering? Well, continue on. I am thankful, God, because I am not like the other men, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. There's a whole lot of eyes in his prayer. 
I am thankful that I am not like all of these, and I'm very thankful, God, that I am this. He brings a thank offering. He's praying about himself. And in essence, his offering is what? His own righteousness. And he is confident in his own righteousness because it is better than whose? Everybody else's. And he is confident because of his own religious devotion. Those two things. He is confident in his own righteousness that he can stand before God because he's better than other people, better than everybody else, and because he is very good in doing things like fasting and praying, all of those things. He is a good and righteous man, better than everything, everybody else. There is one problem with his thinking. The standard for our salvation, the standard for entering into the kingdom of heaven is not the fact that I'm better than somebody else. Have you ever justified what you're doing because it's better than what somebody else is doing? Have you ever done that in your life? It is so easy to do. You may even know that you're doing something that isn't quite right, but if somebody is doing something worse over here, all of a sudden you feel pretty good about what you're doing, even if it's what? Even if it's wrong. I know I shouldn't be in this place, but at least I'm not in this place doing what those guys are doing. And all of a sudden you have just put yourself in a righteous place. But again, the problem with that is that's not the standard by which we are judged. We're not judged because of the good things that we've done. We're not judged because of the fact that we might do things better than somebody else, which is all a lie anyway, probably. We are judged by what standard? The righteousness of God Himself. Romans chapter 3, 23, and we're not going to take time to turn there. I think most of us know it. It tells us that all of us have fallen short All of us have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. What that says is all of us have sinned and we all have fallen short of the standard that God uses to judge us by. So if we really want to be made right before God, we're in a big, big mess because we have all sinned and we all have fallen short of the standard and so there's absolutely no way for us to what? to get there because the standard is the glory of God. It's His character and it's His righteousness. And so this Pharisee is in a very, very difficult place as was Cain and his offering is turned away. Which now brings us to the tax collector. The loved tax collector, right? Was there anybody in all of Israel that was more hated than the tax collector? These guys were not popular. They were the chief of sinners. And let's look at that verse which applies to him here. He only gets one verse. The Pharisee got two. He gets verse 13. It says, But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast. What is the difference we see immediately between the two? There's humility, isn't there? He is in such a place that he does not even feel that he can do what? Look up towards heaven when he prays. And then his prayer. Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And that word mercy is a very, very powerful word. It means to make propitiation. That's a big word that if you have the King James Bible appears about three times in the New Testament. But what it really means is to make atonement for. We want to look at a couple of verses where that word does appear. We're going to be reading here out of my Bible, which is the NIV. And if you're following along in the Pew Bible, that's what you have as well. I'm going to go back to the book of 1 John chapter 1 and begin in verse 9. 
And if you hear 1 John 1, 9, you should already what? You should already know that verse, all right? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Okay, so that's 1 John 1, 9. By the way, 1207 if you're following along. So if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us, as my Bible says, from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make who out to be a liar? Yeah, that's an interesting statement. If we ever claim to be without sin, we're saying that God is a what? A liar. I don't necessarily want to go there, so I'm not going to claim that for me, okay? You make up your own mind. But as we go on, it says, we make him out to be a liar and his words have no place in our lives. Chapter 2 now, and we're going to go down through the first two verses of chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not what? You will not sin. What is the standard for righteousness in God's eyes? There's no sin. God's design, His desire for me today, for you today, is that we would never what? Sin. Because that's how we are held accountable according to the law. If we're going to get to the kingdom of heaven by the law, we must keep it what? Perfectly and never sin. But notice what it says. But if anybody does sin, this is what, by the way? It's grace, isn't it? God's desire for all of us is that we wouldn't sin. But his grace says, but if you do sin, there is one, we have one, who speaks to the Father in our defense It is Jesus Christ, and I love this. He is the what? What does your Bible say? The righteous one. To be justified is to be declared what? Righteous. And if we sin, we have one who speaks in our defense, and he is named the righteous one. And it goes on to say in verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What my Bible says as atoning sacrifice there is where we would find in the King James Version propitiation. Okay, He is the atoning sacrifice for my sins, not only for mine, but also for the sins of the whole world. Just flip over a page here. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved, loved us and sent His Son as a what? an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why did Jesus come? Why did God send Jesus here? To be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What was the the tax collector praying for? He was praying for mercy. He was praying for Jesus to become the atoning sacrifice for his sins. What a contrast we see between the tax collector and the Pharisee. One coming in his own righteousness, one seeking the righteousness of who? Of Jesus. John MacArthur in his book Parables, he the Pharisee was certain that all his fasting and tithing and other works made him acceptable to God. But the Pharisee, and he emphasizes one word here and see if you can catch what it is. But the Pharisee was dead wrong. What word is emphasized? Dead. In his own righteousness, he was what? He was dead. He was dead wrong. The righteousness that truly justifies is not acquired by legal obedience or works of any kind. It must be laid hold of by faith. Where did the tax collector obtain a righteousness that exceeded that of the Pharisees? That's where we begin, so we want to pay attention here. How do we bring this back into alignment? So how did the tax collector come into alignment here? How did he have a righteousness that was better than the Pharisees? How could a traitorous tax collector ever become just in God's eyes? The only answer is that he received a righteousness that was not his own. The perfect righteousness of a flawless substitute who in turn must bear the tax gatherer's sins and suffer the penalty of God's wrath in his place. That is a powerful statement. To be justified... His offering had to be a prayer that asked for Jesus Christ to come and bear all of his sins, to become an atoning sacrifice, and to face the wrath of God. 
Now, how many of you have prayed for that in your life? Lord Jesus, please come and take every one of my sins away from my life and take the full wrath of God that I deserve upon yourself. Become a sacrifice for me. And in turn, Lord, then give me the righteousness of Jesus. Have you ever prayed that before? That was the prayer of the tax collector. He was asking Jesus to come and take the penalty he deserved. That he could have the righteousness of Jesus, of God in his life, and be declared righteous. That was his prayer. <clears throat> Steps to Christ. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. And he lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his what? His righteousness. If you give yourself to Him and accept Him as your Savior, then as sinful as your life might be, for His sake, you are now accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Is there an amen to that? That is good news, isn't it? This isn't a cover-up. This isn't just trying to get rid of something and pushing it away. This is Jesus taking it away forever and replacing it with His righteousness. And you stand before God as if you had never sinned. Back to our children's story today. What Alicia did is what we try to do too often with our sins and our self-righteous attitudes is we try to cover it up and hide it so when it, other people look at us, it would appear as if we had never what? We had never sinned. But what's really under that? What's under the cover-up? The sin's there because it really hasn't been taken away. It never will be until we give it to Jesus. And you see, when we give it to Jesus, we are, there is a cover up when we give it to Jesus, isn't there? Because we instantly become covered in His what? His righteousness. His blood. But the neat thing is, is there's no under, unrighteousness under that. He doesn't just cover up the filth with a clean white garment. He takes it away as if it had never been there. And then He covers us in His perfect righteousness. And when God looks at you, it is as if you had never ever, ever sin. And you are declared righteous. And that's what it means to have a righteousness better than a what? A Pharisee. Because you see, really, there is no righteousness in a Pharisee, is there? And if that righteousness is better than everything else, there's nothing to look for there. But there is a righteousness in Jesus. A righteousness in Jesus that when we go to Him, it will become our righteousness. And then the good things in our life won't be us doing a bunch of good things trying to impress God that we're righteous like the Pharisee was. The righteousness in our life, the good things in our life, will be God doing what? He'll be working through us. Last verse that we have today here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Page 1162. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul is writing there. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and do His good what? Pleasure. Stop and think about what Paul says. When you consider 
your righteousness and your salvation. He says you should do so with what? Fear and trembling. Why would Paul say that? Well, because it is absolutely the most important decision that you will ever, ever make in your life. Have you ever had a real tough decision to make that kind of scares you and you really have to think it through and and either way looks very difficult? We come across those. And that's what Paul is saying because we as humans, our natural tendency is going to be more like the Pharisee than it is the tax collector. We are more apt to rely on our own righteousness than we are the righteousness of Jesus. And so Paul says, when you are considering your salvation, when you are considering the kingdom of heaven, the greatest thing that God is ever going to give you, consider it with fear and trembling. Think very carefully about the decision that you are about to make. Because if you come to me in your own righteousness, you are going to be rejected and you will be lost for all eternity. Is that a serious decision? It is very serious. And remember what Christ's object lesson said. In the church today, there are two worshipers, two divisions of worshipers. Those who are trying to live in their own righteousness and those who have given themselves over to the righteousness of who? To Jesus. Do you know what that means? That means within these walls today, amidst all of us that are here today, there is two groups of worshipers somewhere in this room. There is someone who is relying on their righteousness and they're going about doing a whole lot of good things and looking at themselves as being just a little bit better than the guy over there because I read the right Bible translation, I eat the right foods, I go to church on the right day, I'm better than they are, and I am secure in my own what? My own righteousness. And if we are coming before God with that offering today, it is a thank offering, and we are praying with ourselves. We are bringing the offering of our righteousness before God. And I would tell you today to examine your heart, and if that is where you are today, you should be examining your heart with fear and trembling. Because to continue on that road is to have your offering turned away. But notice what the verse says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and do His good pleasure. There is a difference, isn't there? The difference in me doing things to impress God and me allowing God to work through me. Martin Luther put it like this, and this is really cool when you hear what he says. An ape can cleverly imitate the actions of humans, but he is not therefore a what? A human. If he became a human, it would undoubtedly be not by the virtue of the works by which he initiated, but by the virtue of something else, namely by an act of God. Then having been made a human, he would perform the works of human, humans in proper fashion. Do you get a sense what he's saying here? If I'm an ape, I can be very clever, I can do a whole lot of things that make me look like a what? A human. But does it make me a human? It doesn't. And therefore my actions really aren't the actions of a human. There are the actions of an ape who's trying to look like a human. There are a lot of apes trying to look like humans in the Christian world today. And acting like a human doesn't make an ape a human. Then he turns to a more scriptural picture here. 
Paul does not say that faith is without the characteristics of works, but that it justifies without the works of the law. Okay, so Paul is saying that faith doesn't come without works, but being justified comes without the works of the law. Therefore, justification does not require the works of the law, but it does require a living faith which performs its works. Now that sounds just about as complicated as what Paul usually writes, doesn't it? But go back to the ape and the human here. As a Christian, if I haven't truly accepted Jesus Christ into my heart, if I'm relying on my self-righteousness and the fact that I might be better than somebody else out there because of all of the things I do, I am an ape trying to be a human. And no matter how hard I try, how many good things I do, it's not going to be the case. For me to be a human, something has to happen, and it's not going to happen by the things I'm doing. It's going to happen by God coming in and changing my life, taking my apeness away and putting in His goodness and His righteousness. And then all of a sudden, I'm still doing good things, but now I'm not doing the good things of a sinful heart trying to impress everybody that I'm righteous. Now I'm doing the good things because it is God who is where? God is in me, and it's His righteousness that is flowing out. It's a pretty incredible picture, isn't it? There are two classes of worshipers in our world today. Those who are relying on their own righteousness, and those who have chosen to accept the righteousness of Jesus. Our prayer today must be that of the tax collector. Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus Christ, come and pay the penalty of God's wrath that I deserve and put your righteous character within my heart that when God sees me, He would see me as if I had never sinned. God have mercy on me, a sinner.